listeners one and all for another episode of HTO. I hope you're all well. Looking forward to those longer days, spring and therefore summer is coming. Um, we're joined by a couple of guests today. Um, again, we've got another person in for their second cap on HTO. So that's, that's not too bad a, an appearance at all. And, we, and they're joined by another student of ours on a masterclass. So firing some questions at our special guest. That's right. We're joined by the one and only Stuart McFarlane, head photographer at Arsenal. What success the last pod was that Stuart was on. So we thought we, we're going to have to get him back. We're going to have to get him back. Um, we're also joined by Meg, who's a student from Derby University, football journalism student. Like I said, he's going to put Stuart under a little bit of pressure later with some deep, deep, deep technical questions. Don't worry, Stuart, they're not really. Um, Andrew, how are you? Are you well? Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, echo all those thoughts. It was uh, That was some debut last time. Possibly the best Arsenal debut. I can think of actually. Yeah. That's a pod unto <laughs> itself, isn't it? Scrap that. We're not asking Stuart any questions. Yeah, we're not going to ask you any Stuart questions, Stuart. What's the best Arsenal debut you've ever seen? Meg, throw your questions out. <laughs> Ray or Ray did. Ray or Ray Best Arsenal debut. Oh my God. Ian Wright. Ian Wright, surely best Arsenal debut. Well, didn't Ian Wright have that record where like every club he played for, he scored his debut for a while? And to, I think to his last, mm. maybe to his Celtic extent. He did it at the Hammers as well when he went there. Um, obviously, did it at Arsenal as well. Yeah, yeah. Natural I was going. I was going to. I was going to. I don't. This, this isn't going to be an Arsenal loving listeners, but um, the uh, it will be. I, I remember the the Jose Reyes. God bless him. Um, it wasn't his debut. I mean, the debut was against City when he came on in the pouring rain when he almost scored goal, that didn't screamer. Yeah. Didn't he um, score but, goal in that game? Who? No, that was Middlesbrough. No, yeah. Middlesbrough. Yeah, Middlesbrough yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then he, he scored a couple of those screamers against Chelsea in the cup, didn't he? That was his first goals. But yeah, that's no, I remember crazy. that that, yeah. that debut is like a. I just saw one Cruyff turn. And I was like, yeah. This guy's got so, it. Like. So. <laughs> yeah. um, what we got in store today, Andrew? What we what we what we putting him under the pump for? Well, obviously, last time it was yeah conscious that it was turned it into a bit of an Arsenal deep dive, and we just we want to alienate alienate everyone else that supports other football teams. Um, so we keep it quite technical this evening. And um, obviously, Megan has joined us today. How are you doing, Megan? You well? Um, yes, I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Mm, pleasure, pleasure. Looking really looking forward to the this evening's chat. So, so before we do go for a little few questions, are we can we are we just going to get thirty seconds out of the way of what a good week it's been in 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 the Europa, Europa Cup for a couple of reasons then? So Arsenal trouncing Olympiacos <coughs> slash scraping through, um, <laughs> but more importantly, seeing obviously the lovely Spurs fall out of the competition, you know, lots of little violins going off. Do you enjoy that? Do you enjoy the last couple of days, Stuart, from a fan's perspective? Yeah. Do you know what? The first time ever I woke up the morning after an Arsenal defeat and I was skipping to the bathroom to have my shower because I was just woke up and just thought about Jose Mourinho's face and uh, what, watching the extra time in our office after jumping up and down, screaming and shouting when the goals went in. So I was quite happy that, uh, pretty happy Absolutely. about the goal for Tottenham last night. I also really enjoyed it, obviously, and this is off the back of the North London derby as well. And um, it's probably done the rounds. I'm sure lots of people have seen it. Jermaine Jenis up in arms around uh, the, some of the decisions that went Arsenal's way. And then his tweet saying that, oh, it doesn't matter. We'll see you in the Europa League final and we'll see what happens then within the week. Only karma can do that to you. I say only karma and Jose Mourinho. So sorry, Andrew, I just had to get that out of the way. And now we'll draw the line under any of that baiting and, and any of that sort of, you know, Mickey taking this done. Well, actually, just one that I was going to say to Stu, what, what's the what's your best North London derby moment, Stu, to sort of capture, would you say, down the years? To capture or to be at? Oh, let's do I both. Think prob- I think probably, probably winning the league there hmm. was because uh, we won it for the second time in at White Hot Lane in 2004. Probably that because <coughs> oh, so I was too young the first time around and it's one of those you never ever get that feeling but the sort of nerves around it as well and then I think at the end of the day when you've actually come out with some good pictures as well as being a massively emotional situation it's a great feeling and yeah it was yeah got a couple of decent pictures that day but it's more about the emotion of you know we're just recording what's there but it was a yeah, I like to remind my friends who are Tottenham fans that you know we won it there twice, and I was there to occasionally WhatsApp them a few pictures from the Ashley Cole and Thierry with the inflatable <laughs> trophy on the centre spot. Oh, uh, you know when we yeah. weren't meant to just be celebrating afterwards, were we? Because it might entice. No, the police. The police told us not to, and then 
and then we decided to celebrate. Absolutely, well, yeah, but, there but there's that there's that great photo, photograph, isn't it? A few years later, actually, quite recently, of um, Podolski um, at White Hart Lane. Those are yeah. great days. Yeah, yeah, he was very keen. He was very after the game. He ran over to me and said, "Follow me into the crowd." <laughs> I had to change my, change my lens as well. And yeah. he just jumped. The funny thing is, there's loads of star, Arsenal staff. He jumped into the staff section of the crowd. Mm. So a friend of mine who works in our sort of stadium management department is hanging on to one of his legs as he's uh, as he's punched in the air. So, uh, yeah, very good day. Some good memories of, of playing there. Yeah. What, so we, we've got to ask the question there, conversely. Is there any sort of low ones that stick out? I mean, we've been fortunate over the years, but... Uh, I was, do you know, I was lucky enough... Lucky that I didn't have to work at the Gaza semi-final. Semi-final, free kick, yeah. Uh, I was work. I was freelance working for an agency then, and they honestly, they didn't trust me to work at a, at a FA Cup semi-final. Cause I, was quite... I can see why, to be honest with you. Yeah, so <laughs> you know what, do you know where I went? I went to I went to West Ham, Nottingham Forest at Villa Park, the other semi-final, and uh, what was it, 4-0? I think it was 4-0. So mm. Tony Gal Tony Gale got sent off. Oh yeah. So they sent me to that, and uh, yeah, I haven't really had any too too many. At least it wasn't a nil nil, you know. At least there was some drama for you. It wasn't yeah. a nil nil, and you're missing out on the semi. But um. Well, I think I think I was I think I was there at the Emirates for their only win actually, when they came from behind. Um, four three, yeah. Uh, no, it was the it was um. Was it three, three two? two. Was band it of Art Band of Art penalty. Bale got one. Um. Yeah, I was there. That right. was that, that. I think that was. I've only been to about three North London derbies at the Emirates, and that was one of them. So I saw, I saw the air at their only. Uh... Yeah, don't one sticks. One, yeah. one sticks out for me is the year that we, you know, we were sort of chasing them for fourth. They went one nil up, 50, 60, 70 minutes out of that pen, and then Henri scored to, to level it and one all, and we obviously came up and overhauled them mm. eventually. But um, last season at Highbury, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly, and um, yeah, that's a, what a what a tussle that was. Um, I'm, sure, but, I'm sure Oscar's loving all this chat about Arsenal. <laughs> well, actually, we're going to draw the line. And actually, one of the things you did say there that would um, lead me to the sort of maybe one of the first, not so much technical questions, but we did want to dive a little bit into the life of a, a sort of photographer and how much of your time, you know, you have a North London derby, you have a big game, whatever it may be. How many photos would you take on a given night, roughly, ballpark? And then actually, how what is the process of going back? Because... Don't get me wrong, I'm speaking from a layman. Do you just point, shoot, see what fantastic stuff you get? But what's the process beyond that to actually pick, sift through what I imagine is hundreds of shots? Or is that not the case? Well, we're, we're probably, because we it's not just the game, it's the preview stuff, because we have to try and give our social media guys some preview pictures during the day. So it's a lot more now. So we might shoot maybe 2,000 to 2,500 frames per game between the two of both of us, myself and David Price. But then you would have dressing room, shirts going up, player arrival, whatever commercial bits and pieces we have to do. We have to shoot ad boards and stuff like that. And then the game, once the game starts, everything stops and it's just concentration on the game. And then we've got bits and pieces to do during the game. So we'll have to shoot, make sure we get something of every single player for, the, for their social. And then obviously the goals, celebrations and the action uh, so you shoot a lot and then you generally do two to three edits so the first edit would be pitch side and it would be your key shots that you would think that would make that are in, that are important you know basically your best pictures that tell the story of the game and then your second edit is your best is your best action and your third edit is your maybe your sort of stock you know your standard one one player running mm. with the ball at his feet so it's it's sort of done like that Really, and it, there's no there's no great sort of there's no great way to say how you do it. You just use your own eye, really. Mm. Yeah. And, and how long is a process? Does that is that is that something that through through the years, actually, that process becomes far quicker because you can actually distill very quickly which shots are worth sort of holding on to and which ones you can just spin. I, th I think the the social media aspect has massively changed the way that we shoot. There's a sort of I don't know. There's a sort of Instagram. The way you shoot Instagram stuff now, you know, it's not the big pictures now seem to be player walks out to take a corner with the floodlights shining through his hair. You know, that seems to be the one that all the kids like, you know, so we have to try and shoot for social, for different aspects of social. 
Mm. Uh, it's probably got, do you know what I'd say? It's probably got harder because you're just trying to think of the different clients you've got and how to shoot stuff in a in certain way. And certainly, because we supply virtually every player with pictures for their social media, you're sort of chasing around thinking, Jesus, I need that player to get the ball. You know, I need this player to come over the halfway line. So we need to at least get something. And our first questions when we go into the office is, did you get anything on Granite? Did you get anything of David Louise? Did you, you know, it's, mm. right, okay, we covered. Oh, okay, I never so, realised that. Know, you, yeah. You're sort of ticking boxes generally. And is that, sorry, is that contract your obligation that we, as a club, you know, you know, we, we're sitting there as a club, we have to provide these players with a certain amount of shots, or is that just because they ask for it? No, not really, not really, because it, it, when the players sign and I do the opening shoot, I ch- chat to them and to their agent and said, look, this is what we can do. This is what the photographers can do for you. So it's about building relationships, really. Yeah. And, and immediately... You know, I feel that we're giving them something of value, so they will give something to us. So if I ask them for a favour for a shoot or something, it's like, okay, well, that's fine because they give us X amount of pictures per game in training sessions. So it's all about goodwill, really. It's not in the contract, but it's sort of an unwritten thing that we do now. But it's mm. about building relationships, really. Yeah, you talk about relationships there, Stu. How, how's the how's that gone over the years with David? How's that blossomed with your experience? Yeah, like we've got, you know, we've, yeah, we, it, it, you know, it's easy for us. I mean, I speak to our, one of our comms guys in football who has to ask the journalists, who ask, who has to ask the players to do interviews. And he said to me, we're always asking, we're always asking, we can never give them anything back. And he said to me, it's easy for you because you give them something. So you've got a better relationship. And, and I suppose it is because we're helping them promote themselves you know it's it's pretty you know it's pretty straightforward that we just take pictures send them to them they post them they say thank you and mm. it's like the next time you know it, 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 you know it's a really it's a win-win for us all the time you know when I first started I used to print pictures of the players and I used to hang around at the side of the pitch and they, when they run out run off the pitch after the warm-up I'd try and hand them an envelope and say here 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 <laughs> I, mean, I, remember, I remember it took me like about seven games to give Brian Mild a an envelope of <laughs> and he, and he, then he probably ran down, down the tunnel and threw him in the bin anyway because they weren't very good <laughs> you talk about relationships and they're obviously like you said building that rapport building that trust is there a moment as a photographer that that you consciously don't take a photo of or or, or is there sensitive moments whether that be really bad injuries whether that be dressing room i'm thinking pizza gate i'm thinking sesk i'm thinking well, you know whether whether it be that end of the spectrum or more, more sensitive a loss or or a, like i said a bad injury or something like that or actually do you try and have to detach yourself from that shoot everything and then that that process can happen or thinking through it well, that's not right yeah, well, yeah we shoot everything because we're there to record and in a hundred years time hopefully when the archive we've got a million pictures in in our archive yeah, so so in 30, 40, 50 years, someone will look back and they'll look at, you know, when I'm long gone and they'll be like, okay, this player got sent off in this game. There's a record of it. You know, there's a record of this, there's a record of that. You know, the injury stuff we shoot because we'll give it to our medical team. So it might help in when they're doing presentations or might even in certain situations, David got an unbelievable picture of a, one of the players having a ligament injury and it actually showed how, how far his ankle bent over during the contact and it was very valuable to to our you know to our head of medicine mm. so we shoot everything but a lot of it we keep to ourselves because we only want to promote stuff that's positive to the club yeah but and also ultimately if you've got a player who gets a red card if they you might you know person you know they might leave the club and you might send them a picture of them getting sent off or doing something stupid and it's just a bit of a laugh you know so yeah. you know, we, we we keep everything so i think we should but we don't send everything out that we that we shoot no, quite. Yeah. So I think Tom and I have done okay so far on the technical front, but we're going to go deeper into this dive now. Um, and we're going to a lovely assist from from Tom there for Meg um, Burkamp esque, got to say. Um, it, it'd be but, fortunate. It'd be fortunate. I think. Yeah. Dennis. Um, or maybe uh, maybe Erdegaard to keep it uh, modern. But um, yeah. But yeah. So obviously Megan from from Derby Uni um, joining us. So um, all yours, Meg. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, my first question is on the topic of the recent North, and, North London derby win. 
obviously that's the first win for Arteta as an Arsenal manager, but it's also the first win in a North London derby behind closed doors. What was it like capturing that without the crowd there, without all the atmosphere? It's. I think we're all at a point now where we're just desperate to get the fans in. And I speak to the players, they are, I am. But it's just a very strange... You know, in a game like that where it's so intense, you, in a way, there are points in the game where you don't realise there's no fans in. But there are points in the game where you just see, you look around and you think, oh my God, we just need fans in. It doesn't take away from the the sort of pressure and the enjoyment, but you want to share it with, you know, I, I know a lot of the guys come to the stadium, I know a lot of fans and, you know, I've been longing to see them in, you know, back, back watching watching the game. I think the pressure is probably, I don't, I feel, I'll probably feel more pressure when there's fans in because the atmosphere is raised and there's a bit more of a buzz and, you know, you get a little bit nervous before the game. But, but when it's behind closed doors, it's a little bit like a training game and you, you know, losing is terrible, but it doesn't feel like when you lose a game with no fans in, it doesn't feel as as bad as losing when there's loads of fans in because you, you sort of... Uh, feel the emotion of the of the of the fans when you're working. Mm. So I mean it's horrible, but I mean God, at least we won. That's the main thing. One hundred percent. And so obviously you've captured so many iconic moments over the years. Would it be too hard for me to ask you if you've got a few favourites that you've captured or is that something impossible that you've captured so many amazing moments? Well do you know I, I don't think of I don't really think of mo. I don't really think of pictures. I think of moments. So I can go back and say winning the league at Old Trafford, not the greatest picture, but ultimately, like in a it, a long way down the line, it's not about the quality of the picture. It'll be about capturing the moment. You could get a terrible picture of the most dramatic moment of the season, but as long as you get it, so there's not really. I've had two. I've had so many. I mean, I've I've, I've taken some really nice pictures but they might be on the training pitch. You know, I, I always think that if you get the big moments in the big games, even if they're not the greatest pitches, at least you've got them. And you're not, and when you're working, when you're a football photographer, you're not always in the right position. It could be the other side of the goal. You could be blocked. So you're, it's a bit, a lot of it's about luck really. But you know, any, any sort of winning goal against Tottenham is quite a nice picture to get. Obviously. And this is one I'm quite interested in. Obviously, you've captured and photographed so many different players. Is there any players that you love capturing due to like their personality that they show in the pictures or the way they play? For example, one of my favourites recently is when you capture a Bamiyang smile, like it sort of radiates through the picture. And I love seeing the pictures of him sort of on the training pitch. It's stuck. We've got a bit of stick from it in the last few years, I suppose, because of club's not been as successful as it was but I love taking a picture of a player smiling during training because it's a game that we love the players love playing the players love training they love football so have a picture of a player smiling and or laughing or joking I think it's a really nice thing and I know that I know that the fans like it obviously if we're on a bad run I don't post those pictures even though every day the players enjoy training and stuff but you know Oba's great, you know, I used to love photographing, you know, people like Thierry and Dennis and Patrick Vieira because they're, they're all quite mischievous. Every training session had a bit of bite, but had a bit of laughter and stuff. I mean, there's too many, too many to mention, but at the moment, you know, I suppose it's your popular players like Bakayo and Emil now, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the ones who, I suppose it's the ones that, who are popular, who are easy to photograph, and the ones who are very confident. But Ober's great, isn't he? Lacquer's great. You know, is KT them... just there for business? I imagine Tierney's in and out. He's there to train. Yeah, uh, he's, you know, he's like, Stuart, get away from me. I'm, I'm, here, I'm here to do 500 more laps than anyone else, hit 700 yeah. more balls yeah. than anyone else. Look, he's... photos in the snow as well. Yeah. He's, he's great. He's just, I love KT. Uh, yeah, everyone loves KT. I spoke to I spoke to a couple of the boys from the from the back from the from the back four, and they're like he would fit in with us. Proper player, yeah. He would, yeah. Yeah, he's 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 such a breath of fresh air. He's really uh, he's like kids. He's like guys who used to play. I used to play Sunday league with you know. Mm. 
You couldn't yeah. afford to buy a jacket. You just yeah. turn up in your t-shirt. That, that Tesco's bag is just genius, That's isn't it? That's iconic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, 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 you mentioned there, Stu, sorry about the, sorry to but the, okay. you mentioned the whole kind of training ground atmosphere and that, that invincible team, you and Omri and Burkamp. And um, how has that changed over the years, that kind of training ground atmosphere as the game has changed and the player has changed? I, I, th- I think at the time when I first started, they didn't really want me there because there wasn't, because it, it was so private, you know, and I had to work a little bit with, you know, persuade Arsene Wenger that there was value for me being there. And he was, he was absolutely unbelievable with me. And you, you struggled because you had a lot of old school football people in there, but the, when I got to know them, they accepted me, you know, I, I think I said before when, when I first started, I'd drop my cameras and I'd go and collect footballs and move the goals and stuff. So you sort of try and help out, try and do lots of different things to get accepted. Bill Evans in the back as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look, I played, I played centre half with Steve Bold in the staff game. That was that was a dream come <laughs> true for me. But but you have to. The, the football environment is quite a tricky environment to get into because they're ingrained in it. A lot of these guys. So I found that I. You know, I, I would do more for them as more as much for them as I could to the detriment of my job at the time to get accepted. So now, it, for me, it was little steps, little steps, and and now I'm accepted by all the footballs. You know, we got coaches who've come in who've been worked at Man United and whatever, mm. but they know that I've been there that long and they trust me. You know, if there's I mean, there isn't, but you know, if there was a fight on the training pitch. And, and they heard my camera go and they'd know that I wouldn't send those pictures out. You know, it's all, it's all about trust really. Mm. But, I, you know, when I started, I was some kid, but now I'm the oldest person on the training pitch, which is a bit... Did, did you keep a, a clean worried. sheet with Baldy? Baldy? Yeah, did you keep a clean sheet with him? Yeah, when we, I've been, all I wanted to do is put my arm up and we managed yeah. it a couple of times. <laughs> I, think I think they were on side anyway. And but. sing hot stuff, you know, so, you know, form on these the style. <laughs> um, <laughs> like lucky, the back uh, lucky there was no VAR then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Meg, Meg, we think you've got a few more cues, haven't you? Yes, um, obviously you've mentioned Wenger was brilliant You with at the start. What was it like capturing his final moments as Arsenal manager and what was going through your head when you were capturing those, you know, final photos of him? We, we had quite a... We always had a really good relationship, but my relationship with him was very, very respectful in that on the training pitch, I would... If I was in his eye line, I'd move away because I think I was a distraction. But certainly in the last few months, we probably talked more than we ever did. Um, when, he, when we played Huddersfield in his last ever game, I was sitting on the bench before the game editing pitches. He came and sat next to me. and he, We were just chatting about different things. And, uh, you know, the, funny, the, the day that he, the day after he announced his retirement, I walked out to training with him. And it was the day after myself and my partner had our three months scan for our for our baby, and we were talking about you know talking about our kids and stuff like that. And I was thinking, oh my god, you know, Arsenal's leaving, and he's just asking me about if we've got any names for our baby, how important it is to look after your children, you know, stuff like that, you know. And and it was it was quite a you know, he, he was very interested in his staff, always talked to his staff, wanted to know stuff. He talked to me about photography, asked me, asked me questions about photography. And it, it was really heartbreaking to see him go because he'd been there for 20, 22 years and I, he was a bit of a father figure to all of us. But I think he left in a really nice way. I thought the club handled it very well. He handled it very well. And it, and it in a way, sometimes emotionally you switch off and just do your job like I did last day at Highbury. It was just like, this is our list of jobs, bang, 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 get them done. And then the next day you're emotional about what you've done. And it was the same with Arsene. It's like, there was a lot of preparation about how, about him walking out the tunnel, about where he was going to stand. It was like, this needs to happen. And you're, you're, not, emo- you're not emotional about it because it's mm-hmm. like, this has to happen here. And it's only after the event that you start to get emotional. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you remember the last photo you took of Highbury? Uh, well, I take photos most of the time, really. The last photo of Highbury on the match day, I walked up to the top of the... No, last... No, my last picture of Highbury was Paddy Gallagher, who was the 
yeah, used to clean was him cleaning the dressing room after the after everyone after everyone had gone. Yeah. So that was my very last picture. That's that's my saddest day at football game stadium is last my last game at Highbury. You know, closely followed by a Champions League final defeat. But nonetheless, I still think leaving Highbury was worse. But nonetheless, sorry, Meg, we keep on cutting across. You see, no, no worries at all. I've only got two questions left. Terrible. So. Um, obviously, you've mentioned your relationship with David Price. Do you sort of use each other's ideas, give each other new skills and techniques, sort of, and bounce off each other in any way when you're doing your job? Yeah, I, I, we've got. We don't. We're not competitive, but I think we both want to. We both to win. Very, you both want to win. We're not competitive, but we compete. You know. <laughs> No, we're not competitive. I think I think we're, the, we're a team. We're a team of two. We've worked together for whatever, 18... I think David's been with me for 18 years now. So the main thing for us is not about getting the best picture. It's between the two of us getting the best picture, getting the best set of pictures. Yeah, we share... We, we both ask each other advice. Uh, he, he's, he's incredibly talented considering that I went through the sort of educational system of photography and art school and graphic design and, and he didn't at all. It just makes me think I should have just not bothered going to college. I should have just picked the camera up like he did and then uh, use your natural talent to become a really good photographer. But we, we, I suppose we do sort of challenge each other, but not verbally, more I look at his pictures and think, wow, that's great, I should try this. And he might, hopefully, he does the same with me. Mm. That's brilliant. And um, lastly, I'm no, unfortunately, I'm no expert with cameras, but on a typical match day, how many different either cameras or different lenses would you say you would take with you on a match day? So we would take, I'd have three, three or four cameras. So I'd have one, which, which would be on my long lens, which captures all the action up the pitch. Then one, which would be a goal mouth camera. And then one which should be a wide angle. So if a player runs over to celebrate and they're basically on top of you. And then we might put a remote camera, which is fired on a sort of radio waves that's clamped up in the stand. So four or five different lenses and maybe four four different cameras. Brilliant. How How is that sort of, you know, obviously the, the, the cameras get better, the, the lenses get better, but how has that tech stack changed over the years? So is it, in those early years, you working up with one camera, one lens, it is what it is. Or... So two, two cameras, two cameras, two lenses and film. So you take six rolls of film to a game. Each roll of film had 36 exposures on it. So you could get to 75 minutes and it's, oh, oh I've got no more film left. So what do I do? Yeah. But now, obviously, using digital cards, and you can That's put two issue, and a half yeah. thousand pictures. And when I started, everything was manual focus, so it's all technical. But now it's point and shoot. You know, it's a. Uh, Did you ever miss anyone, out on a, a, miss out on a winner or something like that? Because you went out film. You know, I'd love to take a photo of that <laughs> in your early yeah. days. I'd have loved to have captured that game. But you but know, you know ran out of film. The funny thing is, what you do is when you had a roll of film in your camera, it got to about say he's got 36 frames, 36 exposures on the camera. And then you get to sort of 25 and you'd be thinking, oh my God, if they if they attack now and they score, I'm going to run out of, I'm going to be on match of the day. I'm going to be opening the back of my camera, putting another roll of film in. So you would sort of shoot, the last 10 frames on your roll of film would be crap because you'd be <laughs> just trying to waste it so you could put a new roll of film in. Yeah. Like, everyone... everyone if, no photographer, if any photographer says to you they either forgot to put a roll of film in their camera or they run out of film while, while something was going on in front of you, well, they're, they're a liar because we, you know, everyone's, everyone's done it. I shot, a, I shot a game of rugby in South Africa and after about 20 minutes, I thought, my God, I mean, what's going on here? I opened up the back of my camera. There's no film in my camera. <laughs> We, we we spoke to Andy Bernstein, um, Stu, the LA Lakers photographer, oh, okay. on the pod a few weeks back as part of this series, and um, we asked him, "Are there any inspirational figures for him, even like growing up in the industry, but also now as well? Um, is there any names that you can think of in like down the years who you sort of looked up to in that way and sort of wanted to?" sort of emulate or also now that you've got your eye on and think wow like they're they're a really talented up and coming photographer. well i think the the big 
sort of iconic photographers when I first started. It's a guy called Chris Smith who worked for the Sunday Times, who mm. was like the sort of godfather of sports photography. But mm. he was a very artistic photographer, great ideas. He, he was just unbelievable. And then there was another guy who worked on the tabloid side, a guy called Monty Fresco, who could basically, he would go to England training session and get a player to stand in a bin because he thought it was a funny idea. Or get, if we play Mexico, he'd, go, he'd turn up to the training session with a sombrero and say, and they go, no, I'm not putting that on, not putting that on. And in the end, they'd be standing there on the back page of the sun, they'd be standing, Stan Collymore would be there in a sombrero. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Was, well, but I loved Monty because he, the way he interacted with people, whereas Chris was very artistic and very technical, Monty had a good way. And, and my job is, I try and do what Chris did to do, take great pictures, but you also have to, you have to have good relationships mm-hmm. and you have to put players in situations where they're not comfortable and you have to reassure them a lot of the time. So a lot of it is about, I'd say my job now is more about building relationships and then the technical side of the photography probably comes afterwards because the trust thing is a massive thing within football yeah that's that's fantastic i mean we're also sort of delving now into aren't we sort of tips for maybe students that are up and coming that have their eye on being a photographer um what, what are the what are the key things would you say that the key values um stuart if anyone it, if anyone out there is studying if you're, if, you're, if you're dealing with people i think the you can be not the best technical photographer, but you need to be outgoing and you need to be able to speak to people and, and relax and make them relax. That's the whole thing. And if they feel comfortable, if if someone points a camera at me immediately, I feel I don't like it. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the hardest things to make someone, you point a camera at someone and say, oh, can you smile? Mm-hmm. No, one, that, that never works. You know, that never works. I mean, I did, a, I did a shoot for Adidas last week with like 12 players. And it and it was like it was quite it was tricky for me because you're getting them it was a bit out of my comfort zone but trying to get players to do certain stuff Mm. but you use your relationship with them to get stuff out of them so I know stuff about players during games and you know about this social not you know not this social but little things that happen yeah 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 and you and you just try to get a natural reaction with them or you tell them a joke or something like that but Mm. it's there's certain you talk to certain players in a certain way. The English players, you can say whatever you want to them because they get your humour. But the foreign guys is a different way to talk to them. So it's all about building relationships. And but you know, try and if you're going to go on a shoot with someone, try and have a five minutes with them before. Research their background. Ask them something. You know, when a new player signs for Arsenal, I'll go through where they've been and I'll see if they've been at a club and they've played with someone that I know who's been at Arsenal. So mm-hmm. I'll say, how was blah, blah, blah. I knew him from this time or, and it's those little things. And then, then you get a little bit of trust and, and they respect you because you've, they appreciate, they think, well, you know something about me. So there's a little bit of respect there. So that, yeah. that's really the main thing for me. It's about, it's relationships really. Yeah. Mutual connection. You mentioned earlier as well, um, spectacularly not, not managing to photograph a rugby game for 20 minutes but uh, but I will appreciate mostly you've been predominantly sort of obviously Arsenal and in football I wondered if there was a sort of sporting event or sports star out there that you'd just sort of love to photograph in action that you never got the chance to you'd love to be up close and just sort of follow them snap them I think someone like Muhammad Ali or Mike Tyson someone like that one of those real sort of iconic characters yeah yeah just I think if you know if I worked in if I worked in if I worked when Ali was fighting, I mean that would. I mean he's probably the greatest sportsman ever. Mm. But to be able to photograph him and, and boxing, and it wouldn't be a footballer because you don't get to connect with footballers. But if it's boxing, it would be that behind the scenes stuff, and you know, and then people would all, all the great pictures of Ali are seen all the time. I mean, pro- mm. Probably him, I think. It would yeah. be a single sportsman. Mm. Yeah, nice. Nice. Or Cliff Bastard. Cliff, Cliff Bastard, maybe. Yeah. Goal scoring machine for us, <laughs> Arsenal. I wanted to just pick up on actually, you were saying a minute ago, Stuart, about the whole kind of relationship and being behind the camera and then taking photos of people on the other side. And we obviously we did a film series a few weeks back and we were talking to a lot of sort of few film directors and producers. And it was really interesting actually. They were they picked that out as well about that building of trust with who they were directing yeah. in a film. 
Um, is there? Can you see those similarities in the professions? There, there, it, it's trust, really. And then the moment that someone trusts you, their guard comes down a little bit. Mm. And and, that, and I speak to other photographers who come shoot our players on a open media day, and they say to me, "Oh, afterwards, oh, he was tricky. He was tricky." And I, I say, well, "No, he isn't." Mm. But I'm not gonna. It would be the same as me going into another football club. But I would, if I went into Tottenham or Chelsea, I would, I would do my homework about the players. You know, I'd, I would, I would try and try and build a, you know, try and build a relationship in thirty seconds is is tricky. But mm. I'll try and say something, and it wouldn't be too. I wouldn't be ass kissing that. Oh, you were fantastic at the weekend because they just think you're an idiot if you say that. So. Yeah, there are there are similarities, but that, that that's the key thing. I they, think, really. the, um, the, the sort of the Turner brothers who sort of um, founded Four Seventy Three, but um, produced lots of films like sort of uh, the Class of Ninety Two, and and we tweaked to them also about I Am Bolt, the Usain Bolt um, documentary. And they said one tactic they used was to get actually Usain to do a lot of the filming himself and fo- right. photographs him, uh, in himself, but just, you know, because the character he kind of is. Does that ever happen uh, in terms of, do you ever do you ever get sort of candid shots from the players that they've just taken themselves and or you just, do they, do they basically do they steal your camera and run riot? And then you're looking at it later and thinking, who's, you know, has this been all but classic? I've got 300 photos here of just everyone up to no good in the change rooms and then on the tra- training pitch. No, they liked a few of the, few of the boys when they walk off they like to grab the camera obviously at the moment since covid they're not allowed to you know we have to keep our distance but jack wilson was quite keen on grabbing the camera taking some pictures meza was a few of the boys you know if it's a nice day the sun's out and everyone's messing about they you know they all think they that they will think they can do anything and they will think they're photographers and they keep saying to me look at this great picture i've just taken and it's um my standard line, <laughs> that happens like every time my standard line is you stick to your job, yeah. you're, pre- you're pretty average at it, and I'll stick to my job, I'm pretty good at it. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, none, of, none, of, none of them would make photographers, I'm afraid. All of that behaviour would just outrage Kirantini. He was, he was like, guys, come back to the training pitch, get on with the training. <laughs> all, these, all these players grabbing the camera, just, guys, you can't think take of your, it. Yeah, take your jumper off. Take your yeah, jumper take your jumper off. off. Yeah, yeah. It's, only, those, it's only minus one. Those, <laughs> like, those gloves and tight, yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely well um Stuart it's been an absolute pleasure again um you've been fantastic um I can only imagine you and Kieran you know in the shorts and short sleeves and in the snow snapping away and capturing all the photos forevermore as much part of the furniture for Arsenal as Highbury and Wenger obviously became as well um and also as much part of the furniture on HTO so we really appreciate it so thank yeah, you yeah one for coming on again one more no one more appearance for a for a HTO football shoot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. send you one down the line. Absolutely. <laughs> maybe it'll be in the uh, Europa League final against Spurs. Oh no, though. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a record. Maybe we'll maybe, ne- right. maybe next season's Europa League. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, not if we win it. Not if we win it. We'll be in the Champions League. It's more yeah, we'll get back down. Than we well, let's, well, let's hope. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Fingers crossed. We really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Mm. Thanks no again. No problem at all. Take care. Take care. All the best. Meg, how was that? Did you enjoy um, sort of throwing some questions at Stuart? Yes, that was brilliant to put him put him on the spot. But yeah, really, really interesting answers for the questions, and a really you know genuine and humble guy, and gave some really good insight into you know his life at Arsenal and what he does on a day to day basis. Yeah, I think so. And what was really interesting for me, I don't know if you felt this, um, Andrew, that we 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 saw a bit more of sort of the, 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 the sort of the technique behind his approach to what he does. I think the lot the first chat we had with him maybe he just didn't trust us he said it was all about trust and maybe the first time he didn't trust us but it was really nice to hear his sort of approach to the way he builds rapport with with the subject he's photo photographing and, and probably gets better results because of that yeah definitely i think um it was it was nice to sort of do our best in that regard as well because we're not uh we haven't got any photographic background um apart from the odd instagram shot but um, yeah don't get me wrong i can i can put a banging filter on but um I don't think I'd ever be a chief photographer. What was your classic sort of, you know, when sort of Instagram hit and like, I, I, I'll be honest, I barely use Instagram now. I think I looked the other day and the last photo I uploaded was April, like last year. Um, so I don't really use it anymore. But do you remember like the classic filters that are on there? Like, you know, could you put a bit of Mayfair on there, you know, and back in the day and you had those sort of like those, those classic filters. Do you remember any? Like, which... Saturation. 
saturation and blast that saturation up get the color coming through was is there one called like x pro or something like that that really just used to make things properly crystal mm. clear that was just you know i think you, actually you, i've got my my background on my alarm on my alarm is um a, a picture i took at the emirates in the i think it's the west stand against palace when ramsey scored a last minute winner on the opening day i think yeah. it might have been one nil um and that's still my background now so um yeah. yeah. Well, that just shows that just, you that Stuart's probably got nothing to worry about. I was going to um, say, it just goes to show like the level of you know quality that I take. It's, it's yeah, still, but to be it's fair, still, it was the background. I regularly get over ten likes on my photos. So to be frank, you know, I, I think I could easily take his job. Um, but listeners, thanks very much for tuning in again, um, Stuart. I do think your job's just about safe. Not sure we're going to steal it from you just yet. Um, for all the latest, obviously follow us at, at HTO Football all your channels, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, you know where it's at. Um, Stay tuned and we'll speak soon.